Welcome back internet learners. This is episode two of learning motion control and IO with PLCs. We're back at the test bench here just for a second so I can show you how this EtherCAT system is wired up. These are both network cards on top of the PLC here on the left side. The yellow one we're dedicating to EtherCAT whereas the other one's going to handle our regular TCP IP networking. This is how we program the PLC. In practice it wouldn't necessarily need to be there but modern days pretty much everybody runs some sort of networking to their PLCs. So pretty much just have this one here and then of course we got the e-bus out this other side for anything that's going to be in the cabinet with the PLC we would typically just run those uh, e-bus slices right there and not bother with cables but for servo drives and remote mounted stuff you gotta have something to get this ethercat out to a cable so we're gonna dedicate this network card to be an ethercat master so if you take a look down here I've got my IO this bus coupler right here on the left side is an EK1100 and what that does is takes an EtherCAT RJ45 in sends it back out but in the middle here it puts all of your eBus slices as well so you could have these mounted in a remote box somewhere uh, or just somewhere else in the cabinet if it doesn't make sense to put all these up here in the line so uh, what we've got here is like a potentiometer slice on the left there we're not going to mess with that too much uh, an EL1008 and an EL2008 uh, that's digital input 24 volt DC, digital output 24 DC. So you could flip solenoids with this and read sensors with this. So that comes out at EtherCAT in this green cable here, and it runs down to the floor, back up here, and yellow is 24 volt power to this pod here. That's an EP2318. It's got four digital inputs, four digital outputs, so kind of a mixed thing that you might put out on the end of a robot that had a little bit of I.O. in both directions. So it goes EtherCAT into this M8 connector and it has a spot for uh, an M8 to come back out if you can see that. So that can jump over to additional slices or pods rather and go to other, you know, back into servo drives or wherever you want. So it's really flexible how you set all this up. Alright, so we're back on the PC side right around where we left off in the last episode. I can come in here and add a new device. This is really cool because you can add in all sorts of different stuff. Serial port, you've got device net, um, ethernet IP, all kinds of stuff that you can buy these little adapters for or you can uh, sometimes use built-in drivers like ethernet IP. If you have an extra network card you can make it an adapter or a scanner or you know master slave. Um, you can pull in can open, profi net, all kinds of stuff and just straight up uh, TCP IP as well if you want. Um, so in here though what we're after really is an EtherCAT master so I'm gonna add that guy in right now and open him up and right off the bat he hasn't been assigned to any hardware he doesn't know really what he's looking at so we need to go tell him hey you need to be bound to that bottom network card that had the yellow cord coming out of it so we'll come over here and when I'm connected up I've got this PLC targeted here so I'm actually talking to it uh, kind of in context of that PLC. So I'll come here and I'll say search for devices. This PCI bus slot is actually the eBus going off that right side that I kept pointing to. So we're not going to mess with it right now because I don't need to talk to any of that I.O. We're setting up the stuff that's coming off of that other NIC. So this will actually end up being its own EtherCAT master on the system. This one here, I'm going to just guess basically, local area connection. I normally like to name these on the PLC one of them called EtherCAT and one of them called LAN or something and then those names will travel through here just to make it a little clearer when people go back in and debug but since I didn't rename those I'm just gonna pick one and you can see what IP address it got uh, this is a link local address which basically means it more or less doesn't have an address um, it can talk to other link local stuff but that said it searched for DHCP and nobody gave it an address so it's just hanging out that's what we want because it actually doesn't need an address at all to talk on EtherCAT and for that matter, you can go and uncheck the TCP IP stack uh, on the driver, and that'll make sure that nobody really mixes it up for other stuff accidentally. So uh, it's grabbed the MAC address. That's another way to check and make sure you have the right one. But we know we do because the other one, if I were to pick it, would have that 192.168.1.130. And so we don't want that. Uh, this is the one we want. We're happy. So we can come back here, and normally what you do is scan, uh, but there's not an option here. So it's not super obvious, but the reason is because we're down here in the bottom right we've got run mode selected so let's go ahead and kick this guy back into config mode that was with this little blue button here load IO devices yes I don't think that matters for what we're doing but I always just hit yes there it doesn't hurt anything 
So you come in here, um, we could name this if we wanted, just call it local um, Nick or something, you know, whatever you want. Right here, we'll scan this. And so it automatically just found all that stuff. So terminal one is what I was telling you is an EK1100. Then we've got the 3255, that's the potentiometer slice. Then we have the 1008, the 2008. So these are inputs here. You can see it's a channel one input. It's an eight channel card here. Channel one output. That's an eight channel card as well. So you have this extra stuff, WC state. These do have meaning and they can be helpful when you're debugging. Data valid, data invalid. So you can kind of check that uh, and make sure that everything's good. And then you've also, if you collapse that, you've got some info about um, things like your your slave configured count, your slave found count, stuff like that. So there is some uh, useful stuff in here, but uh, that's a little bit more advanced for when you're debugging. For right now, we got what we needed, and we can look at these values with this handy little graph built in, but nothing's really gonna work yet because this is really just kind of our working copy. It's not what the PLC knows about. So let's go ahead and save that, and I'll activate this configuration. Okay, so this error message, um, it says it needs at least one variable linked to a task variable. So the way this works basically is you've got, we talked about tasks in the first series, so I'm not going to go too much more into them, but basically these guys are saying, hey, I don't have anything linked to me, so I don't know how fast you want me to run or anything. So these are essentially not going to do anything right now. So even if I were to go and set one of these outputs here, it's not going to actually happen on the slice because any something on this network card needs to have a sync master. So you can either do that by making a fake task or by linking up one of these uh, guys here. That will do it if you're just playing around right off the bat. But since we have real I.O. we're going to mess with, we'll just go ahead and start that process next. Okay, so I'm back in our main program and I wrote some little bit of code offline just to save the typing. And essentially what I've done here is converted heartbeat over to a byte, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, one here is just a bunch of, of bits, basically, just Booleans. And those Booleans are, are either true or false. And then this is kind of the magic part here. It looks a little bit confusing, but you're just saying that one exists at the memory address Q, and Q means the output memory memory space. There's there's only a Q and I, so don't let that stress you out. Uh, and then star is where you normally would put the memory address, but rather than dealing with that all on your own, star just says let this uh, mapping system kind of handle that for you, and then you don't have to worry about shifting addresses. And I, I think for a long time people had to put these in back on older PLCs, but on this you don't have to anymore, so I'm not going to. And We'll go ahead and here and type um, uh, prox at percent i star. That's our input, and then these are going to be our outputs. And so once I've done that, let me grab some extra code here. We're still incrementing our heartbeat every scan, and this code basically just uh, it takes the heartbeat, modular divides it, and sees if it's equal to zero. If it is, it'll turn the bit on. If it's not, it'll turn it true. So that's just some just some easy code to make it blink these bits at random, not really random, but in a sequence. So I'm going to save that, build the solution, and it's still complaining about that, but that's okay. So uh, now that we've built, we should be able to come over here to our uh, terminal 4, this is our EL2008, right click, change link, and these show up now. Untitled 1 is our, uh, our PLC's runtime program, and then we've got 1, 2, 3, and 4, which are part of the main program. So as soon as you put that Q star on there and then build, it becomes part of your image. So now I can click on it, hit OK, channel 2, I'll do the same, OK on down the line and there is a way to sort of automate this if you have tons and tons of IO but let's not worry about that today so our other one our prox this is a percent I star saying it's an input so it's coming into our program and we can make decisions based on that value and affect the outputs so we'll just feed this into let's see where I wired it one two three four five I believe so we'll wire that into five and 
There we go. So now once you save it, none of this happens and, and takes effect until you activate again. Just with I.O. changes, most of the code changes you can do online without shutting down the system. Okay, so I'm activated. I'll log back in. And I'll hit run. And you should be able to see these blinking. So these are actually blinking really, really fast, but this online view of them shows them slower. So we can check that here and see what the graph looks like. And we'll jump over to our uh, other video real quick and take a look at it. Okay, well back to our program. I'm not really that happy with what we've done here because we don't utilize our procs at all here. So I've wrote a little bit of code offline here. I'm going to paste in. It just says if the procs is true, then go ahead and do our blinky routine. And if not, just turn everything off. So we're going to save that, activate it, and we should be good to go now. All right, so I've situated the proximity sensor right on top of my inputs and outputs there. Uh, as I get close to it, you'll see the procs will light up as soon as it senses the metal, and that turns on the slice to the left's input, which then our program tells those four outputs to flicker. So you can imagine this would be analogous to something like a part showing up on a conveyor, and then these outputs would actuate from your program control to fire a cylinder, like a pneumatic cylinder, or turn on a conveyor zone or something to that effect. So. Uh, hopefully you understand that as, as a pretty basic IOS uh, example and you know it works very similar to this for the rest of the IO types uh, analog stuff and uh, just all sorts of different voltages whether you turn on a motor it all pretty much is the same as far as getting that through the EtherCAT network and into your PLC so we'll dig a little deeper on the next episode and uh, like and subscribe and uh, I will see you in the next one bye